turkey and everybody ate their fill and that's Thanksgiving this is the day after and uh, welcome welcome very very much to conversations a uh, pleasure to welcome to the program here uh, Josh Volinsky a stalwart member of the Manhattan team and a person of really great great deep interest in a whole lot of different subject areas and has had a long life of active involvement and we're going to be talking about those things on this day after Thanksgiving uh, of the year 2008. Joshua, welcome again so much, very much to conversation. Well, I want to thank you, Harold, and I want to thank you for yesterday. It was just just such a wonderful evening. You have a wonderful family, mm. uh, you know, young and old, mm. a, a wonderful partner, Maggie, mm. wonderful dogs, <laughs> wonderful grandchildren, a yes. wonderful sister, just a wonderful... Yeah, I could mention that. I haven't seen her in a long time. My dear sister is living in St. Louis. As I was just saying, she's got 17 grandchildren, and it's like a Norman Rockwell painting when you see them together, and they were all gathered at the house for Thanksgiving yesterday, and it would have made a wonderful scene of Thanksgiving, and we did a program earlier. It will have aired on Tuesday. This is going to air on the Thursday next week. Uh, with the young man who's part of the family, but they were all great. It was just such a good time and happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. But I, I, and I was trying to get my sister Shirley to be here uh, to be a guest, and she just wouldn't have it. And so we're yeah. being filled in, and I appreciate it with uh, with Josh. And I want to start Josh with you because you've had such an interesting long term. I remember when first you told me well, you're here, a stalwart member of Manhattan Neighborhood Network but that you've been involved with, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, p the Pacifica and WBAI, I think you told me one time, since about 1963? 66. 66. So, I mean, that goes way, way back that you were involved with that. I wonder, why don't you share just a little bit, if you would, your own background. I mean, you were born and raised in New York, your family a little bit, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, Josh Berlinski in the past tense and then bring it up to the present. But share your own background. Well, I, um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. born in Brooklyn Jewish Hospital, uh, 1934. 34? Uh, You're uh, older than I am. I didn't yeah. think anyone was. About yeah. three or four months. Three or four months, yeah, right. right. You yeah. were born in March? Of 35. Uh, March 15th? 14th. 14th. Same and birthday I, as Abraham. I was born uh, in October. Okay, good. And uh, then, um, then I lived in Brooklyn during the Depression with the landlord knocking, at knocking the door. on my parents' door, mm -hmm. door on Cotillia Road and so on. Mm. And then, uh, <clears throat> then for a short time, we, we also moved... Uh, to Washington Heights and so on, uh -huh. and uh, then uh, <clears throat> my parents divorced, uh -huh. and I was with the metro uh, with my mother, uh -huh. the matriarch of the family, uh -huh. and she and her sister got jobs in Washington D.C. Uh -huh. with uh, the Soviet Purchasing Commission. Oh, uh, I don't know what and, that was. And uh, she worked with people, like I mentioned to you, like Fiorello LaGuardia, yes, who was uh -huh. the director of ANRA, uh -huh. and Governor Herbert Lehman, mm -hmm. who was the director of ANRA, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. What was that? What, United States Relief and, uh, for, for Europe, or for what? What was that? Well, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration was an NGO, mm -hmm. which eventually was incorporated within the United Nations and became an agency of the United Nations. Uh -huh. But it actually was started during the war years mm -hmm. before the UN was founded. So as an NGO, it had the job of supplying essentially non-strategic supplies to our allies, uh -huh. like harvesters, tractors, plumbing supplies, uh -huh. and I think I told you uh, 
my mother and my aunt started as typists uh -huh, uh -huh. in the purchasing commission. Mm -hmm. Bilingual typists. Mm -hmm. They were very fluid, fluent in Russian. Oh, right. Okay, they'd come Russia. And yeah. Okay. Literate yeah. in Russian. Uh -huh. So they were English, Russian translators, and they worked with Soviet uh, personnel in buying strategic um, uh, materials from the Soviet Union. And when they first started, they were young women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Sure. Beautiful women, you mm -hmm. know. Everyone dated them. Everyone yeah. loved them. Mm -hmm. So the first week on the job, being very social, uh -huh. they gave a nice party mm -hmm. on Harvard Street in Washington, D.C. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And a general, a big general, <coughs> uh, and the Soviet, uh, uh, the Soviet. Purchasing Commission was a corporation of the United States of America, but it was managed by the Soviet Union. So, um, so this general demanded to sleep with everybody at this party. So the women said, "What do we do with this?" gross individual. Yes. So they <laughs> what took did they do with him? They... And they put him in the cab and they sent him home. <laughs> the next day, uh -huh. when they all came to work, they all had pink sleep slips. No. So my aunt was always a pessimist. Yeah. She said, well, I don't know what happened, but you can't fight City Hall. That's Whatever wrong. they said in 1942. Yeah, right, right. But my mother said, no, this is unreasonable. Uh -huh. Our supervisors... Mm. Love us. Uh -huh. This makes no sense. Mm. I'm going to speak to the consulate general. All right, good. And yeah. she went. And the consulate general said, I believe you, Mrs. Walensky, mm. but you must put this in writing. Okay. Tell us the whole story. Right. So she did put mm -hmm. it in writing. Mm -hmm. They investigated. They rehired everybody. Isn't that wonderful? And they loved they loved the way my mother had uh, composed they, the letter, and the story, the, yeah, uh. and they offered them both a higher position and a raise. Oh, right. Isn't that a success story? And they took story? this yeah. general, uh -huh. they promoted him, but they sent him back. To Antarctica. <laughs> to, yeah, they <laughs> sent him back, you know. Mm -hmm. They said, they, and they apologized to the women, uh -huh. and uh, they felt based on the letter that my mother was extremely competent in Russian and English, and she was supposed to chaperone the engineers when they were buying these supplies. Mm -hmm. So they started working with ONRA, United oh. Nations. So LaGuardia was the head of yeah, ONRA. Right. Now, can you imagine Giuliani no. being the head of an agency like ONRA? It's a different like thing. Coming ONRA. out of the war, terrible devastation in Europe. It was awful. So there were efforts to try and even think ahead beyond the end of the war and so forth. Yeah. But it was a terrible time and everything. And they were able to bring some support to that. And now, uh, uh, and now we, we so so that so they were doing work that was socially uh, yeah. beneficial to people that were in great need. And I've told this story before. LaGuardia went to Youngstown, Ohio with the engineers. My mother came along as a translator. And he loved my mother. He said, Mrs. Walensky, there's one thing I love about you. You know, many of the translators start hallucinating and believing that they are the authority yes. rather than the translator. Yeah. But you yeah. always have the right sensitivity and perspective and you and it is very clear that you're just trying to do a job and help people uh -huh. and really um, give us the information we need to do our work and uh -huh. we love you for that yeah 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 so, and that's a state of consciousness that's very favorable yeah. yeah that's a good state of consciousness to be in to do because that because a lot of these translators start thinking they're, they're the ones that's speaking and right. making policy right so anyway they went to Youngstown, Ohio, and they spoke to this industrialist, mm -hmm. and they were buying pipes 
for this the Soviets. after Union. the war now. No, during yeah. the war. During the war even, right? And, uh, and this, this was for reconstruction of damaged infrastructure yeah, in Europe. Yeah, bombing it and destruction. Yeah, sure, because it was terrible. Yeah, right. Okay, that was good work that they were doing yeah. then. So anyway, this industrialist said, I'm not going to sell these people pipes. And LaGuardia said, why? He said, because they're communists. Uh -huh. So LaGuardia said, all this my mother is translating to the engineers. So LaGuardia says, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, I thought they were our allies. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what LaGuardia said. Mm -hmm. Mussolini and Hitler mm -hmm. are is the access. <laughs> yes. The, and secondly, we're not buying these faucets and pipes for communists. Mm -hmm. We're buying it for women who have to climb up five flights of stairs. Yeah, carrying water. Pump up water. Yeah, yeah. And use the water for uh, cooking and yeah. washing. Right, right, right. So, uh, so anyway, I had this remarkable matriarchal family mm -hmm. of my mother and my aunts. Mm -hmm. Of course, it got me in a little hot water mm -hmm. because you... You pick up a lot of bad habits if you're just surrounded by strong, aggressive women. Like what kind of bad habits do you pick well, up if you're surrounded you by don't strong, have enough aggressive women? Men to show you a more aggressive, a more, more aggressive, more male pattern. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I had that, and then uh, when I came back to New York, I went to PS seventy five, and then I went to City College. PS seventy five is where in Manhattan? Oh, in the Bronx. In the Bronx, oh, right, yeah. right. You went to school there. Yeah. And then you went to City College. Yeah. Out yeah. of there, and yeah. you went right into what? What were you studying in that sort of thing? Oh, I was you know, studying. I was majoring in art and studying art. psychology uh -huh. because I am a painter. I do painting. I didn't realize and this. photography. I want to see have you had shows and everything like that? Uh, well, I've had a few one-man shows. What did you? I I, I want to learn more about that because I didn't know you were. Are you? Did you work with acrylic or oil or were you? I worked painter? mainly with oil and watercolor. Watercolor. And I've had a show big here. Difference between oil and watercolor. Yeah, yeah. I had a show at upstairs with uh, my friend Vicky Lebowski, mm -hmm. or Vicky Vashalov, mm -hmm. where. Uh, they showed, she showed my paintings on my show. Uh -huh. We were disgusted. Uh -huh. Some paintings I had done in oil. Well, are you still doing that or not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're still doing that. Yeah. I didn't realize that's a whole another aspect of uh, Josh Velinsky. I yeah. didn't know. I didn't catch up with that. Yeah. Have you got quite an over, over it? You know, have you got quite a few collections? Yeah. Where do you, do you keep them? Do you work large or small? Small. Small. Well, that's easier to keep yeah. within the apartment. Yeah. And, that, and you have yeah. them all with you. Like, yeah. you don't have them yeah. stored in a separate... My, my house is a frightful archive. Frightful <laughs> archive. Yeah. Frightful yeah. archives. I'm still I looking for the super. Yeah. A few years ago, he came in to f fix the faucet. I still can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he may be buried in a book slide or yeah. something. Uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't know that you were a painter. That's really it. I want to see uh, some of your work and stuff. Yeah. I would really like to do that. Yeah, maybe, probably we didn't have some here. But. Maybe I can use your space. Well, like Frank Fred Craven. Well, I don't know. We got other. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but anyway, I didn't know you were in the arts, and then you were also doing psychology. Did you say? Well, minoring in psychology. Minoring in that. And then you went and you did your degree there, or no? Yes. Did, you yes. did, yeah, a bachelor's degree. Yes. At City University. And, and then what did you do after you'd taken that educational course? Well. And wasn't it a great experience being in the university at that time? And that school was yeah, a great yeah. source of learning. Yeah, I try to articulate it now, mm -hmm. and it's so difficult because, first of all, there are many misconceptions about uh, city university, especially City College at that, that time. Mm -hmm. It is true that it was very male. Now, let me get this right. Is the one up on 130-something? 138. Yeah, something. right. Okay, gotcha. It right, was right, very right. Jewish. Yeah. And I even had an acquaintance, Colin Powell. A little lone fellow, Colin Powell, right? Yeah, and he and I were on a book voucher program, which mm -hmm. meant that anyone who made an agreement with the college not to write in the books. Yeah. We could get our textbooks free, mm -hmm. but we weren't supposed to write in them and mm -hmm. return them at the end of the semester. I see. 
see. So okay. that was the book voucher program. Yeah, they had that then. Yeah. And then also they had uh, the tuition situation was different than it is now. Oh, yeah. You it just was, paid for student fees. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, and you had the education available to you. Yeah. And it was a heck of a school. I mean, a real lot of learning and also real serious scholarship. Yeah was taking place. You know, yeah. people tend to associate with Harvard or something. But that university was a place of tremendous intellectual output. It was the Harvard of the poor. Harvard of the poor. Yeah, that's, that's what they said. That's an interesting term, isn't it? Because yeah. they, even though yeah. I knew, in my years there, I knew some wealthy people who went there. One person went for nostalgic reasons. Okay. She insisted on going to the university that her father went to. Okay, yeah, But right, she was wealthy. Right. Uh. The second person I knew was from a wealthy family, but again, her father was a tyrant. He felt that women should uh, stay home in mm -hmm. the kitchen mm -hmm. and make babies. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. did she go ahead and mm -hmm. do? Mm -hmm. Her name is Sylvia. Mm -hmm. She moved out of her father's apartment. Mm -hmm. She got an apartment for $45 a month on Grand Concourse, uh -huh. and she went to uh, City College. Right, right. And uh, she's still a friend. Still, <laughs> yeah. And she's now uh, she's now in a, a very successful electrical engineer. All right, that's for good. private corporations. Yeah, I wonder if that that thing of going to Harvard or Princeton or whatever uh, or those schools it's 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 a matter of. The people that are in your class you're going to meet are going to become future leaders. They're seen that way. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of making contacts that are going to be useful when you get out, if you're going to go into a law firm or something and that That's kind of right. thing. But if you said the Harvard of the poor, yeah. then you're going to have some of the best scholarship comes out of people who are not wealthy. There's a difference between wealth and uh, intellectual intellectual accomplishment it seems to me I don't think they necessarily uh, uh, coexist each other you know and that the real intellectual accomplishment is not really part of the wealth you have advantage if you're in that kind of a situation and there's generations that can do that you got the Encyclopedia Britannica and all that sort of thing and the context but an intellectual environment is not necessarily characteristic of a wealthy environment. Mm -hmm. There's a difference there. Or, or, or you know, uh, prominent even in business and so forth. You understand? So you're saying the intellectual, uh, of, uh, the, the intellectual center of the poor might have some of the real intelligentsia or intelligentsia is there more than they would be at some of these socially uh, recognized schools where you have a lot of yes. social contact going on mm -hmm. and a lot of... Uh, life experience that isn't very beneficial to the person that's getting that experience, even if it's at Harvard and so forth, or uh, to the general society, more than a place like uh, the university that you got your education at, yeah. and the social contacts you made among people who are really intellectually engaged. Well, you know, there were, as I say, there were some misconceptions. One of the misconceptions were that originally at City University, the criteria was, the requirements were that you live in one of the five boroughs, uh -huh. and two, that you maintain a, a C average. Well, okay. A stable C average, mm -hmm. not an A or B average, because if you read Colin Powell's autobiography, mm -hmm. he says, I always maintained a C average. I wasn't a B student, I wasn't an A student. At the university, yeah. 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 Also, when Townsend Harris set up oh, yeah. City College, Townsend Harris said, let the rich sit alongside the poor. Mm -hmm. So City University was not closed off to the rich. In they fact, had open admissions, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's another story yeah. which I was in on. Because for 50 years, yeah. I stayed on at City College yes, for did. 50 years. Mm -hmm. In the institutional bookstore, yep. which is this bookstore owned by the college, uh -huh. and I was also an adjunct uh -huh. at City College. Uh -huh. I was teaching art uh -huh. as an adjunct. Oh, were you? Good. I yeah. didn't realize art. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think everybody who's gone through there knew you. 
Oh, yeah. And you know more people than you can shake a stick at in terms of all levels of society and are what is called a networker extraordinaire, and that's true, and it would have been uh, built out of that association you had because everybody comes through the bookstore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, one guy I met at the bookstore mm. who was a student at City College mm. was extremely wealthy, mm -hmm. but his story was, and this is in the already in the 70s, and it wasn't that fashionable. His story was he was gay, openly gay. Uh huh. So you're, let's now say now you're talking about the late forties and the fifties. Uh, this was seventies. Oh, in the seventies. So he would. Oh, oh I see. Uh, this is after you were a student. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. He would come in mm -hmm. and discuss his male dates uh -huh. on the weekend, mm -hmm. and actually mention, hey, we really went to town and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Now. If he had gone to Princeton or Harvard, mm -hmm. he would have been ostracized. Uh, but at City College, he could get away with it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And one day, he became the assistant manager of the uh, City College Institutional Store. One day, I come in, he was designing a mansion on paper. Mm -hmm. I said, whose mansion is this? Mm -hmm. He said, this is my mansion. <laughs> I want to, I want to, he finally did. He said, I want to, my parents are getting old, uh -huh. and I want to resettle in Florida, so I'm designing the mansion that we want to live in. <laughs> and it was beautiful, and, and his name was Glenn. And uh -huh. he was a multi-millionaire yeah. student, and he was going to City College because it was very easy for him to navigate and survive at City College. Okay, and also preferred to yeah. the Ivy League. Yeah, and it's yeah, the yeah, it is. Um, it's hard to know. I mean, it, it, that would be to have. You said Townsend. That 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 became a very famous school. I mean, a preparatory school and everything. Uh, Townsend Heron, Harris, or is it? Um, Thompson Harris, right? Yeah, yeah, very... Um, that was the first Maurice building. Maurice Capram, God bless him, was oh. very much involved with that. Uh, and he passed recently, sad to say. He was a wonderful guy. But uh, the, the, the mixing of them, I think it's probably a good idea for there to be that kind of mixing for both sides of that. If somebody is... Uh, if you know, if you're not just blending in with the people at the country club and that kind of thing, because it can be incestuous and not particularly beneficial in terms of the whole society and the university that you were associated with was very much that way and you were at the heart of it all at the bookstore yeah. so everybody come through and you're meeting everybody and you have a great personality for exchanging in, in, in intellectual yeah. discourse and so on so it must have been a very good place for you to be well I also pumped new life and mm. new concepts into running a bookstore for instance I had weekly concerts and autograph parties. Really? I wasn't the manager, uh -huh. but the manager loved me. He was mm -hmm. named, his name was Ronnie Garrison, uh -huh. and he was a promoter, uh -huh. and he loved my concerts. Uh -huh. But one day I fooled him. Mm. One day he said, you know, Josh, you keep bringing people, these folk singers here. I had <laughs> Phil Oaks. Yeah. I had Phil, Phil Oaks. And who's this I had, guy called Zimmerman that's got no that's talent? That's right. Yeah. And oh. I, oh, well, you know, Zim, <laughs> I did meet Zimmerman. Did you, but yeah? I had mm. invited Joan Baez. She uh, came. She came. And she brought Bobby Dylan. Wow. So I yeah. said, so I said, who is this guy? And she said, oh, this is Mr. Zimmerman. Yeah. And I said, what does he loop. do? Yeah. Is he going to help you perform? Mm. And she said, he just writes songs. <laughs> and uh, I think he strummed the guitar for me. And I look at Joan Baez and I say, he has the worst voice I ever heard. <laughs> I don't want him to perform. <laughs> I don't want Zimmerman to perform. Yeah. But I can yeah so I can remember coming back with been 66 65 out of having been 2 years in South America doing research with the Amara Indian peoples of Bolivia came back to New York or came back to Detroit where the home was and uh the whole world had changed everybody had their hair growing and it was all the Beatles and all that and everything and they had Bob Dylan and he was the one that was really something he was a fantastic poet he had about three or four or five years there where he was so right on to, you know, and everything like that. 
But I remember playing the record for the first time, and I thought I had it on the wrong speed. <laughs> because it didn't sound, but the, so it took a little bit. But it didn't take long for me to realize. No, this man is a real genuine genius, you know. And he was. Did he? Did he play there at the store? Or not? Well, no, he no, he never played. He was just a visitor. And then mm. later on in the year, I met him over at Broadside Magazine. Mm. I was also a volunteer with Sis Cunningham okay. and Gordon Friesen. Uh -huh. Sis Cunningham originally was in the Almanac Singers. Mm -hmm. Then she was in the Weavers for a short time. The Weavers, yeah. And then she put together something called Broadside Magazine mm -hmm. that Moses Ash capitalized on. Uh -huh. He started Broadside Records. Uh -huh. And he was the first one to record Bob Dylan oh, really? singing some song about the Ku, a Ku Klux man uh -huh. who has to go home uh -huh. and look in the mirror, uh -huh. and meanwhile he's very sweet yeah. to his child yeah. and uh -huh. his uh, his wife, and then he goes out and lynches the, uh, black people, and, and that's all in fruit, his yeah. first song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was one. He was just really great. And that's getting into the '60s and that. Yeah. And uh, so that's it. And that's about when you also became associated with BAI, apparently '66. Yeah, '66. And the BAI airwaves were there all the time as a progressive radio outlet, well, listener support, yeah. and so forth. And but I want to say one yeah, thing uh -huh. about. Uh, so anyway, my manager came to me and he said, stop bringing me these folk singers. <laughs> he was a Frank Sinatra fan. Well. So I said, okay, I'm going to work on a jazz program. Okay. So I, I decided I would love to have Herbie Mann. Remember yes, Herbie yes, Mann? Yes, of course. So in that year, <coughs> this was 68, <coughs> everyone lived in... Uh, Manhattan. Mm, Greenwich Village. So yeah. I, I looked in the phone book for mm -hmm. Herbie Mann. Yeah. Was he in the book? There was a Herbert Mann. So I get this <laughs> Herbert Mann. Yeah. And I ask him, are you the Herbie Mann? Mm. What would you know? Would you <laughs> believe it? It was. Ah! So he, I told him, I would like you to come and perform at the City College door. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. He said... Mr. Uh, Joshua, you can't afford me. Mm. I said, but wait a minute. This is, <laughs> this is during a class break at 2 p.m. <laughs> he said, during a class break? It's, that's when I'm asleep. What do you mean, 2 p.m.? Uh, he said, at 2 p.m. Mm. at the class break mm. on a Thursday. Yeah, on a he Thursday. Said, that's our he day. He said, this huh? is when we're asleep. Yeah. He said, Okay, he said, I'll make a deal with you. Well, what was I'll the deal? come uh -huh. and I'll perform for uh -huh. you, but uh -huh. I'm going to bring through three side men. Okay, right. And you just have to pay them. Will oh. you do it? Uh -huh. So I asked my boss. My boss said he would do it. Okay, and so Herbie did. Mann came, mm -hmm. and he uh, promoted something called the Family of Men. Yeah, the, f the photograph album is fantastic. Yeah. Photograph yeah. album, yeah. yeah, great. The little kids walking arm and hand in hand at the end, yeah, yeah. And the kids loved him. Oh the, yeah, it was the bookstore was large, right. very yeah. large. Yeah, okay, yeah. And he charged us two hundred dollars uh -huh. for his three for side men. Man. Yeah, and, and one got... of them was Armand Jamal. No kidding. One of the side men. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, God, that was good. So you were really an empresario. Yeah, yeah. You and Art Delugoff. You yeah. know, he was doing all kinds of things and that kind of thing. But when did you pick up? And so you were always sort of interested in the progressive things. Yeah. And art and music and politics and so on. And when did you pick up on the BAI that you got associated there? Because well, you go way back to almost... My the, wonderful aunt who was also a typist translator, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but she was such a fast typist, mm -hmm. she never did too much uh, verbal translation. She was, uh, she was like, she was one of these marvelous types before the computer that yeah. could do about 200 words a minute, yeah, 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 maybe yeah. even more, who mm -hmm. knows. So she always stayed. Uh, she discovered BAI, uh -huh. and she told us about it, and then... Uh, my Can you mother remember when that up? was, that, and how old you were, and had you been involved with it later, or how yeah. was it going, and when did it get started, some guy named Hill or something, or something, the BA, the Pacifica? Oh, yeah. Well, BAI really became successful when a Mr. Sh Louis Schweitzer mm -hmm. uh, got tired 
of WBAI was a commercial station. It had been? Yeah, that he owned. Okay. And he said, I'm sick and tired of this. So he phoned up Pacifica and he said, I'd like to give you a radio station, free of charge. Wow. And they hung up on him five times. I think he was crazy, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We don't need another crazy guy. Yeah, okay, yeah. So uh, yeah. they bought it in 1960. In 1960. Now, the Pacifica Network got started out in San Francisco, right? Yes. And that was somebody named Hill or something? Lewis Hill, yeah. Lewis Hill got started. And when did he get that started, let's just say? He... He did that in the 1950s. In the 1950s. And Late it, 50s. Yeah. And it was a listener supported right from the get-go. And then it was also progressive. Yes. And then they got it started. And then they got BAI with the help of Mr. What was his name? Schweitzer. Schweitzer. Already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did it. He made the... Uh, and, and that became a second radio station next to San Francisco? Uh, no. Or? Well, they had only... The, first, they had KPFA mm -hmm. and KPFK. Those are in San Los Francisco? Angeles, oh, Los Angeles. Berkeley, Angeles. California. Right, Berkeley. Figures. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And then they picked up uh, BAI. And BAI came in around 60, when? 60, 1960. 60. Okay, and then you became aware of that around 1966, is that right. it? Right. Okay, so it had been on for six years, you weren't that aware of it, but then your, your, your aunt? Made you aware of it? Yes. And then you became, and then you became involved right away, or you? Oh, I like, I love right on, right. the concept. Uh -huh. And then, as we got to like it so much, we said, "Hey, let's visit." Uh, my mother said, "Let's visit WBAI." It was at that time at 30 East 39th Street, and that was the Vera Foundation. Also, which was owned by Louis Schweitzer. Right, he was their landlord. On 39th Street? Yeah, 30 East, 39th Street. 30 East, the east of Fifth Avenue. Okay, that's where they were originally ordered in. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah, okay. So uh, my mother and I went down there, and the first producer we met there was a Russian lady with a heavy Russian accent, <laughs> and, my, mo and uh, my mother and her got along fine because she was also fluent in Russian, mm -hmm. and her name was Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand was involved with yeah. BAI She gave a commentary. No kidding. The reactionary it, commentary yeah. for 15 minutes uh -huh. one, once a week. Oh, she was regularly on BAI? Yeah. I didn't realize that, yeah. She was the objectivist and Brendan and all that. That's and that right. Was there. And so, was there a lot of prog uh, left-wing progressive people that also there clocked you? Yeah, and quite that got a bit. Started? And did you start on 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 Mike, as it were, or were you administrator? How did no, you get no, involved? I was I was a volunteer for a while. Okay. I mean, I did things on and off. Oh. Like one day, I'm wor working in. Uh, the bookstore, and Professor Elsa Barnett comes in from the music department, mm. and I said, Elsa, I haven't seen you for a while. I was, I was always networking. Now, you are, I, you're still networking, yeah, like better than anybody I'm, I've ever yeah. known. Yeah. So Elsa said, oh, well, I, I said, I haven't seen you for a while, Elsa. She said, well, I've been away in India. Uh -huh. And she said, there's one guy I met in India, I liked him so much. I talked him into coming to City College mm -hmm. and doing a seminar. Wow. And I said, well, what's his what? name? Who is he? And she said, uh, his name is Ravi Shankar. A uh, name Ravi Shankar. <laughs> so I said, Ravi Shankar, isn't that the guy who's giving lessons mm -hmm. yeah, to yeah. the Beatles? She yeah. said, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that night when I did volunteer work at uh, WBAI, I said to their music director, they could have had a music director, yeah. Anne McMillan. I said, you know, we're going to have uh, Ravi Shankar at City College mm. doing mm. a seminar. She mm. said, what? Mm. She said, I want you to help me produce that program. Right, okay. So yeah. I did. I helped oh, you helped her. her. That was the first but one. But she almost had. killed me because, mm. like you said last night, mm. at the Thanksgiving parade, that mm. equipment was heavy. Oh, ah, yeah, and, right. Uh, <laughs> in those yeah. years, it was the, heavy. Yeah, it was, and it was radio heavy. Radio equipment was just as heavy. Yeah, it was. So Everything that was. Yeah, killed all those me. vacuum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just physically. Yeah. Yeah, trying to keep up with all that. Yeah. But then McMillan gave me. Uh, Credit for being an assistant producer 
of that program. Okay, that's good. And then you became more and more involved. Yeah. So you've been linked into BAI yeah. and yeah. and Pacifica yeah. uh, since '66. God bless you. And that's really an important kind of yeah. thing that's still going. Then we had bringing it up more today to be worthwhile. Because we have our executive director here is Dan Cogland, right, here at MNN. Yeah. And he used to be the director of, I guess, the director of Pacifica. Right. And there are five radio stations around the country. That's right. And uh, Berkeley. L.A., Berkeley, Chicago, New yeah. York, Houston. Well, not Chicago, Washington, yeah. D.C., uh-huh. and Houston, Texas. And Houston, Texas, okay. And they, 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 they go well. And it seems to me, if I'm not mistaken, that we had uh, he was the he was the executive director of that network at a certain point in the not too distant past, and then also he had our Amy Goodman was the yeah. news director at that uh, at the Pacifica, and it's a network, I yeah. guess. And then there was a takeover or a change of the board or something, well. and they were let go. And could well. you were you in on all of that? Yeah, I was. Uh, part of that, and that's a very complex story. At this time, I'm producing a program at BAI called CUNY, A Mission Deferred. Okay, good, because you've got all that experience because at CUNY. I was yeah. fired. Mm-hmm. I was fired. Finally, it became privatized, the bookstore, mm-hmm. so I did pretty well with Barnes & Noble. Uh, I was able to keep my salary, mm-hmm. my benefits, but a new company took over, Follett, Mm. And they fired me in a very nasty way. Really? They didn't yeah. like my freestyle. Mm. Norman Siegel helped me. Norman get Siegel's a, a great guy. Yeah. A, a great uh, compensation and all that Good. to a degree. Not as much as I deserved mm. because it was a non union job. But, mm. but uh, anyway, where, where was I? Were you so, yeah. Anyway, so when I left CUNY, mm-hmm. I said, I still love CUNY. When was that, John? Uh, that was 2001. Oh, okay. It's more recent. So yeah, okay. I started a collective mm-hmm. called the CUNY Collective, okay. and they do shows about WBAI. It's still going? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. It was good. last Wednesday. And it was last Wednesday recent, yeah. we were talking about the CUNY Student Forum. Okay. But the week before we were discussing... The plight of the adjuncts. Yeah. So oh, I'm an absolutely. adjunct. Uh, I did the work of a professor, yeah, but right. I get, didn't get any pay. No, it's but just like serfs. Here's an interesting anecdote mm. about adjuncts. Mm. Amy Goodman yeah. discovered WBAI through a CUNY adjunct. Really? Is that right? She came to Hunter College, mm-hmm. and she wanted to take a graduate course in microbiology. Okay. So when she was thumbing through the scheduled classes, yeah. she uh, observed they had a course on media, uh-huh. independent media. So she decided, I've always been l- interested in that. I was she a, used to uh, always be interested in this thing where they have, uh, uh, was it Counter? Uh, I forget who published it. Uh, the, the underreported story of the year or something like that. The, I forget what it was, and she was very interested in in bringing out the stories that are really important that are overlooked by the media. I forget That's what right. it's called, but they gave an award every year, and she was involved yeah, in yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, yes, and they give some remarkable... William Schapp might have been award. involved, yeah, I think yeah. Howard Zinn, yeah. and they were involved, and they'd, give, uh, you know, they'd say, this is a really important story that's been overlooked by the media. Yeah. I forget what they had, a, they had a term for, but she was involved in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something she picked up later with oh, a later. lot of well-known journalists, I remember. But anyway, yeah, okay, so sorry, she looked yeah. at the program, yeah. and she came in to the class, and it was being taught by the gentleman who had Bernard White's Bern- position before he did. He's oh, program director. Okay. And his name was Andrew Phillips. Okay. And he mm-hmm. was from Australia, a okay. journalist from Australia. And mm-hmm. then... Amy and Andrew Phillips liked each other, so yeah. Andrew Phillips said, Amy, you have to come down to WBAI, uh-huh. because she said what everyone says, uh-huh. what's WBAI? Yeah, yeah. She says, you have to come down to WBAI and assist me in my program, Investigations. Yeah. He was from uh, Australia. Yeah, Investigations. Yeah, so, yeah. so he came. Mm-hmm. She came, and she never left. Yeah, right, she right. She never right. left. She yeah. stayed on. She first became news director. 
Yeah, no small matter. That's for BAI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, yeah. And she even covered the story with me when in the first Gulf War I made a speech mm. against Yay! The, yeah. You know, this invasion of the Middle East. Remember how first... Ramsey Clark and John, St and John Alpert, when they, when they bombed in 91, they bombed their Baghdad? Yeah. I was so proud of them. I, I think oh, Ramsey no. Clark should have the Nobel Prize. And they just got, if I'm not mistaken, they had something with NBC or something, and they just got everybody saying, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. They went and got an airline ticket to Amman, rented a car, and drove to Baghdad and started shooting. Yeah. I thought it was just wonderful. They just did it. And he did the same thing uh, Ramsey Clark did in Somali when they, remember they bombed that? Uh, yeah, that, I uh, have that tape. Yeah. And I have to play it on my show. <coughs> I have all of John's tapes. I got him to give them to me. <laughs> he's so great. And Ramsey Clark is so wonderful, man. He's been there. But this thing about how... Uh, in terms of alternate media or progressive media or something like that, radio, BAI and the Pacifica Network's been a real beacon, hasn't it, over the time? Hanging, you know, bringing that message. Yeah. When you got so much corporate media that's coming down with things that are not yeah. are dismissive of uh, progressive thinking, uh, even defining what it is, what it means and everything. But then it seems to me, Dan... And was at Pacifica, and Amy was there, God bless her, as news director. And then they were let go or fired or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. And was there a well, takeover of the board well, or something? Well, here is the story. <clears throat> you know, it's very easy to make generalizations about this uh, story. But the more, you, the more you go into it, the more you investigate it, the more you realize it's a lot more complicated than even a lot of people who love WBAI will ever know. Okay. Because first of all, we had, uh, yeah. we had we had Tree Sleed, who's yeah. a very brilliant, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, capable, energetic woman, all of a sudden becoming a tyrant. Hmm. And then uh, they said that this is a takeoff take over by corporate America. But well, there's been a lot of that going on yeah. in the media. And to yeah. a degree, it was a group of people who really did want WBAI to sound a lot more like National Public Radio. Okay. You know? National Public Radio is a different, pla different place, but yeah. to be on the cutting yeah. edge of progressive thinking but, is a different uh, matter, maybe. But it's true that it reached a stage where both Pacifica and fired Amy Goodman and Bernard White and Sharon Harper. And which, Dan and Dan Coughlin. Yeah, which mm. was un, uh, unacceptable. Yeah. You know. And then they marched in the streets. Yes. They actually, you know, you go and march in these parades and nothing usually happens when you go marching <laughs> up in front of CBS or something, you do it, and they actually reversed it and yeah. they were brought back because usually in the way these things work, the media or the power brokers just don't pay any attention to the people in the street marching with placards, but it seemed to have worked and they reversed it, right? But in a sense, it's what happens among radicals very often. Yeah. Every group thinks they have the real spin <laughs> yes, on everything. Yes, the absolute so, truth. So when yeah. I used to speak to uh, Eutrius Lead, uh. she used to tell me, I have the real spin. <laughs> and Africanism. I have to. The other people are phonies. Yeah. And that's right. why I fired them. Yeah. So it drives you up the wall. Well, it is because everybody yeah. thinks, or the Trotskyites, the Trotskyites yeah. would have Shachmanites and this, and how many angels can dance on the head of a dial? A real dialectical interpretation of the material reality is over here. And they do do that. That's one of the characteristics, is a messy thing. Real democracy is a yeah. messy thing when you it's got that. It's sad because yeah, you, but it Bernard is, but it's White also, said. It's also, it's sad, but it's also kind of anarchically fun in a way that yeah. there are these kind of things that go on when the sparks are really flying and people yeah. are passionate about what they're doing rather than just filling some role. But Bernard White said something very, very touching. He said, it's like a hand. Mm -hmm. If you amputate a finger, mm -hmm. every finger is very important, which is true. Yeah. So you treat lead mm -hmm. was a finger, even if you disagree with her. Uh -huh. So it's very upsetting. 
Well, what gets upsetting is that can we can we have a situation where we can, what is the term in gentlemen's clubs or ladies' clubs? They say we can agree to disagree agreeably or something, yeah. or that you do get into a thing where people are, where egos and uh, people's feelings are hurt yeah. when you get into things where everybody isn't all being very civil all the time. Yeah, yeah. and when their passion is involved. And there's a lot of sparks fly, but also a lot of good truth can come out of that kind of a situation, and does I think throughout history. Yeah. And it's very and do you see Manhattan Network sort of in a continuation in a multimedia context of the spirit of what was the um, the uh, the um, what do you call it um, you know the the national movement the um, not not WVI, but the the whole thing, the the whole thing out of San Francisco was called what is it again? I've just yeah. slipped my mind. It's the Pacifica, the whole Pacifica thing. You see, uh, you see Manhattan Network as being in that vein, or there being sister institutions or philosophies, or is it Manhattan Network? Let's say has a more a larger aspect than whatever is called, because Pacifica tends to think of themselves as progressive. And you have to get to a definition of what you mean by progressive, whereas this might involve people who are more multi-dimensional as far as the whole culture is. You see what I mean? Or where yeah. do you think uh, the, the linkage between a progressive contribution to communication and maybe a more all-inclusive communication that say something like MNN might possibly be, or how do you see MNN? Because you've been so actively involved here, well, MNN, so much a part of it here. I love the people here, but mm. you, you know, I've been wrestling with this in my mind mm. for quite a few years, and I think our problem mainly is the first thing we, the first realization we have to come to that before we're progressives or radicals, or conservatives, or uh, pacifists, or whatever, we have to realize the first thing is we are all human beings. Yeah. And as human beings, we have our strengths and weaknesses. So, for instance, I was so upset when I heard, when I read, that Isaac Basheva Singer wouldn't even talk to his one and only son. And really, what the problem is, is before anything else, we are human beings with our strengths and our weaknesses and our frailties, and, and, and we can all be criticized for our shortcomings. We have to come to a realization. You're not that, perfect? No, we're not perfect. Oh. And I think the last great battle <laughs> we're going to have to fight mm. is the battle with human nature. Well, and that's what I find wrong with M and N, and find it wrong with WBAI. Like I come here and I like Paul DiRienzo, mm. who was thrown out of WBAI. He's a good guy, yeah. and he, uh, you know, he was the guy who was supposed to replace Bernard White. You trees lead used him to uh, replace uh, Bernard White and Amy Goodman when she was fired. Yeah, but she was brought back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was kicked out. Uh -huh. So now he comes here and does a program. It's like know? the purges of yeah. Stalin or something. So he's on a personal level. He's so nice, but when he was on BAI taking over, he was. He was sweet until you brought up that subject, and then he would just hang up on you. Really? He wouldn't talk about it. Uh -huh. Just hang up on people. Power relations. And insult them, too. It, who was it who said power tends to corrupt? Yeah. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, so power is a tricky business, isn't it? Yeah. And also, then the idea of progressive. What is progressive? Um, left? Know. Left wing, yeah. progressive, uh, that kind of thing, and uh, what? And also, bigger one, you can of worms. You have no human nature. Boy, that's a biggie, isn't yeah. it? Because there's all kinds of people who think they know absolutely what the motivating yeah. emotions and intellectual processes of humanity is or are, which is uh, so variegated and so, um, and also malleable. 
That's right. Do you think? Don't you think human nature could be malleable to the yeah. conditions in which well, they are you, interrelating you, with one before another? Before you can accomplish everything, one, you have to listen to other people, mm. and you have to respect them, mm. and you have to give them space and time to express themselves too, mm -hmm. or you fail. You fail no matter what you are, whether you're a progressive or a conservative. You fail. What does it mean to be, in your view, because you've had experience like to be a progressive? What do we mean when we say a progressive, in your view, in all your experience, people you've interrelated to? What does it mean to be a progressive? Well, I think how the do most, we define it? The most important thing of all is to understand the problems of people who are less fortunate than you. Okay, that's so a biggie, yeah. I'll yeah. give you a simplistic a lot of people, answer, yeah. a simplistic uh, story Concerning now. I, I the, brought this up yeah. today. Yeah. I said to the people on the subway train today, mm -hmm. I said, look out in the street. Have you noticed? I've never seen so many taxi cabs in my life, uh -huh. and so many of them are, are vacant. You weren't seeing taxi so cabs. If you're, you're really a making a living, mm. what is it to catch a taxi cab in New York? Uh -huh. Now, but how many of us can really do it? Do you know, it. go from maybe from my house to M and N for ten dollars. Yeah, I can't always afford. You can't do to that do on a regular basis. Too expensive. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, mm -hmm. if you can visualize something like that, that so many people can't do it, or uh, Gail Brewer had a show here the other night. That Does she have a wonderful. regular show? Uh, no, at M and N. It would be good for her. I think it'd be good for a lot of those leaders, local city, to have yeah. regular slots oh. and do and communicate. It was know? a wonderful show, Harold. We it had was to, about the West Side Hunger yeah. Project, uh -huh. and Gail Brewer said, yeah. "So many people are hungry." Because the minimum wage is so low, uh -huh. you never hear that on commercial uh, uh -huh. ray, uh, media very right, often. Right, 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 right. And these people are hungry, uh -huh. and and then the guest said, and so many children are coming into the West Side Hunger Project, uh -huh. and Gail. Brewer said, it breaks my heart. The children break my heart. She's really a fine lady. So in a very real, yeah, yeah, she is. She's been a real a pioneer for public access. Yeah. That's really good. And yeah. But it's like uh, the Gospels and all of the great wisdom schools have been saying over the ages, uh, treat, uh, treat with great respect and concern the least among you and the least advantage. And that's sort of the progressive thing. It'd be called, if it's liberal, and you're trying to help the least advantage rather than just, um, you know, being sycophant to the ones who have the power and so forth and the money, and they tend to go together and that kind of thing. So that's more or less what we mean by the progressive attitude toward the yeah. world, being concerned with not only they're the least among us, Cervantes said there are only two classes in the world, the haves and the have-nots. Yeah. And there's not enough concern with the have-nots and to where you get the whole thing into where you can be concerned with with the whole. Are you optimistic for the human prospects? Do you think things yeah. are trending in the right direction? Are you happy about Mr. Obama? He's trying to set a new course and a new pattern well, and so forth. And I did like uh, Amy Goodman. You count Goodman's. him as being progressive. Yeah. Do you think of him as progressive? Well, he certainly, everyone is more progressive than George yeah, Bush was. Yeah, it's been was, a heck but, of an eight-year uh, run, But I it? think, well, We'll have to push Obama. We'll have to push him more in the direction that we would like him to go. Because first of all, uh, I'm like I'm, as you know, I'm concerned with decent, affordable housing. Absolutely. That rents we can afford. Yes. And I'm also very, very upset about the health system. It's been pushing me around like yeah. crazy. Yeah, and a whole not, lot of other good people. I'm still yeah. negotiating for my teeth and all yeah, that. Yeah, right, and, right, right. Uh, and uh, also, I would love to see a restoration of free tuition at the City University. And I love what Carl Pearson is trying to do yeah. to set up a free... Sounds very imbued with a sense yeah. of justice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's doing it. The Attorney General thing, he's got the idea, and he's got this idea out at, what is it called, uh, Hopeless Indiana? 
he's got a place out there uh, that he's trying to set up, a, and, then, and he's very entrepreneurial. And sometimes entrepreneurial is thought of as not being, you know, it, 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 the progressive thing again, whether it's going to be, everything should be a government program, should there be room for entrepreneurial get up and go and create things mm -hmm. and all that. And uh, the human society is really at a very crucial time, it seems to me now. We just had this awful explosion of violence in India. Oh. That there's still this tremendous uh, conflict that's going on. So concern with these affairs, other than just your own immediate life, is the life of the mind and the spirit and the, the media outreach of that. And we got, like, Amy's got this wonderful show that she's gotten around. Uh, Dan's, a, it seems to me, a good guy here putting this together. And it comes out of the... Uh, Mr. Hill and so forth, and uh, Pacifica and Progressive. But again, it includes a wider expanse of people other than just those who are progressive, it seems to me. You want to touch out to some of the reader, the uh, the representatives. Carolyn Maloney, our, our Congress yes. representative, was here. She was thinking of maybe being able to start a program here. I think it would be good if she could and, and educate. So reach out to some of the establishment figures as well as people that are in the progressive movement thing is what is, I guess, the ultimate thing, you know? Yeah. Communication yeah. is what it's about. We have to reset our priorities, too. Mm -hmm. As I say, you know, like I was so involved with City College, and I said on my show, on our show, we were a collective, yeah. I said, we just have to reset our priorities. We always knew that City College was expensive, but it was going free even during the Depression. Right, right. And right. What, what was the difference? The difference is simple, the priorities. Yeah. They just didn't think. They used to say it's a subway college mm -hmm. and we shouldn't charge tuition. Uh -huh. Now, today, it's still a subway uh, college, now we charge but they charge tuition. Somebody's trying to make a buck in yeah. there somewhere. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a challenge. There's a lot of challenges. The economic questions, it's, the system's been hit upside the head, like Coley Clark would tell us from Mississippi, like a, like a mule down in Mississippi, he hit it upside the head to get its attention. It's been really with this economic thing. So these are really challenging times for coming up with things... Uh, Naomi Klein's written well oh, on the wonderful. economics, uh, you know, that kind of shock therapy, that as a critique of Friedman and that. And so there's a, everything in a certain sense is in very great flux and there's great challenges and the communication about these things is important. And they're in the midst of it all like an empresario, like a Art DeLugoff, an empresario is Josh Walensky, networking between <laughs> all these forces, well, seems to I me. Well, I try hard. Yeah, you do, you do. And you, do, you not only try hard, you pull it off, and you network better than anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's been your play. We've been just chatting here about things, but these are issues that are coming into the holiday season, the day after Thanksgiving, as yes. it were. All the turkeys are resting um, easier in their nests now that the Thanksgiving is gone. And thanks, Josh, for coming in. Really good oh, talking to this you. This hour went so fast. It went fast. When you're having fun, it goes fast. Thank you for viewing. Happy holidays upcoming. Yeah, and happy the one holiday. that just passed yesterday as we tape. But the holiday season's coming up. All the best to everyone there trying to investigate uh, how we can communicate uh, answers to help all the people of the world, including particularly the least advantaged among us. We should have a focus in that way, a sense of service in that way. Thank you for viewing, and thank you, Josh, for such thank a very well-led life yes. that continues. Thank uh, you. Coming back again tomorrow, then. Thanks for viewing.